The Where's America podcast, here it is, and I got my uncle, the one-armed bandit, Johnny Wearsma. And uh, yeah, this is exciting. He is one of the spring car racers in, uh, in here in Edmonton. One of the most winning spring car racers is a sportsman, is that correct? Yes, extreme sprints now. Extreme sprints, most winning. He's a winner. But before all that, you know, not only that, he does that with one arm. That's more mind boggling. But we're gonna get into how this even happened. How do you get in racing? And, because he's a Weersma related to me, we're gonna talk about some family. Oh, Ooh. family stuff. Okay. okay. Now, yeah. now, to do, to, now to do what you do, clearly, clearly you have thrill issues. You must have, madness is part of the equation. It's just an absolute must for this stuff. Because you just didn't do sprint car racing. You were hardcore into so many other facets of racing that are so insanely crazy. Um, we're going to get into that. But what, what was like uh, growing up in the Weersma family like? Because I know most of the Weirsmas are pretty wild, and I'm, I'm included in this. Yeah. So I don't know if it's a genetic thing, but uh, what, what was growing up as, because you were the young one of the younger sons, what was it like growing up in the Weirsma family? Well, I was the youngest uh, for 11 years, then mom and dad decided to have a couple more. Right. That sort of thing. So everybody was older than me for the first 11 years, which is pretty tough to, you know, to live through because every one of your brothers... Is usually picking on you because you're the smallest. Yeah, you get yeah. to beat you it's up. The animal kingdom, yeah, baby. You betcha. So if somebody got mad, hey, let's pick on Johnny or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you know what? It was awesome growing up. Uh, wouldn't change it for the world. The farm was awesome. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have rules. You know, your mom wasn't chasing you around or anything like that. Don't do that. Don't do that. You know, it was a free for all. Like, it's totally different now. Like, oh, it's absolute helicopter. It right? is. It's yeah. nuts. So, you know, we always grew up with the dirt bikes and the cars, the field bombs, we used to call it. You know, all of us had a car by the age of 12 just to run it through the field and, I mean, wreck shit or have demolition derbies in the back 40. Really? Whatever. Yeah. So, it was pretty cool. I think I spent most of my time with Jack and that. Yeah? Yeah, Jack's about three years older than me because we were to school together. I'm grade 10, he's grade 12. You know, we used to go to bush parties all the time, house parties all the time. But as time get, goes on, then we start feuding at those different deals and ended up in a couple of scraps here and there. You and, you and Jack. Yeah, me and Jack and that. But kind of made up eh, during the weekend because we have to live in the same right, room right, right. on a bunk bed. So I'd be on the top bunk and then he'd just kick me off the top bunk uh, halfway through the night or something. I'd land on the floor. <laughs> Wouldn't wake up. Dad would hear it. Dad would come upstairs and put me back in bed and then tell no. me about it the next morning. So, yeah. yeah. And then... Uh, you know, when we first started with the cars, it was always first farming and then a little bit of playtime after. So we had the cars, we wrenched on cars, we wrecked cars, we did everything with the cars. And then a few of the brothers got motorbikes. So now... Which, which, which one? Well, Adrian started first. He had the dirt bike. So every week there was somebody hobbling into the house with road rash or something like that because they flipped their bike over backwards or they'd crash. So every weekend there's somebody hobbling in the house injured. It just shows how crazy it is, you know, like we have such helicopter parents now, but look at the shit you could get away with. And all you guys lived. Yeah. You all well, lived. Yeah. Successfully. Well, yeah, there's a few close calls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your dad was one of them, but yeah, that sort of thing. But all in all, great time, you know, did shit like that. Always wanted to race, had no money. We had no money, you know, there's seven of us. What, what was it like? Uh, because it's so different now. Cause I mean, did you have access to clean water back then? Yeah, it's well water, right? Well water, yeah, okay. you got you got used to it. You know, we didn't have softeners or the salts or because all that kind of stuff. I look at it like in Canada, like it's amazing that I can run a tap and we have clean drinking water yeah. and the rest of the planet does not have that, right? So like that's true because you've been all around the world and stuff with yeah you're you know, not you've seen water. a lot of people without water right yeah, but it's true. it's kind of amazing because I mean you guys like people even the poorest of poor here are yeah. still kings compared to you back in your childhood and you still found yeah. fun and enjoyment and you know there's we didn't know any better 
But that's the cool part you about know, it, though. Yeah. You know, church every Sunday. Mm -hmm. You know, if you didn't go to church, you're kicked out of the house. That sort of thing. So, but, you know, our mil our water was milk. <laughs> I'm telling you. We drank so much milk, it was unbelievable. Because it was free. Right. Right? Right, right. As we milked like 60 cows or something. Every morning at 6 in the morning, we'd milk cows. Every afternoon <laughs> or evening at 5.30, we'd milk cows. My dad would and tell we me. We did that all our lives. My dad would tell me when he was milking cows and that cow stepped in the milk jug. That's the milk he wouldn't drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the one I got. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, I have so many stories about the farming farming and stuff like that. Like, I wouldn't change it for the world. Do you think it was a better <clears throat> growing up back then in that kind of environment than it is now with all these extreme uh, control measures on our children? Way better. Yeah, way yeah. better. You know, and I think now that I think of it, the best part is we don't got all this shit. You know? Yeah. We didn't have something in our hand 24-7. You know, it was a hay bale. It was a hammer. It was a wrench that we had in our hands all the time. We were never in the house. Were you uh, we were always outside. fixing vehicles too in your, in your childhood? Uh, when I was young, I always tore shit apart. Couldn't get it back together <laughs> until, you know, in my later teens. Yeah, yeah. But like I was, I was working for your brother pulling engines when I was 10 and that sort of stuff. In the outside, in the snow, with front and loader, you know, that kind of stuff. So that shit you remember now. You know, because it's kind of neat that I think of it. It's now. super cool, man. It's super cool. Yeah, so you were working cool. with my dad, and then I guess you uh, heard, you told me one of the stories, you took my dad's bike. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I used to steal everybody's bike. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> First, I still, I'd still steal Adrian's bike. You know, he's had a nice Yamaha 360, went like Jack the Bear. I'd take it over to Dill Mitchell's, my best buddy. And me and him would just go crazy all over the place and stuff. And that one was a handful. That's the one you're going to hurt yourself bad. Right, right. Yeah. But I started on a little Z50. Uh, my brother Jack bought a little Z50 and brand spanking new. Hey, <laughs> yeah. So he was, he, that was his masterpiece. And I remember I'd get like eight shoes and I'd put a shoe in, in the front wheel, the back wheel, and each side of the wheel. What do you mean shoe? What's shoe? Shoes so I could put that bike exactly the same spot where I stole it. <laughs> and so I learned how to hotwire it. And that. So I'd take this thing out and I'd go for hours in the back subdivisions, which wasn't really there. They wasn't developed yet. So I'd be cruising all over the place. I'd come back two, three hours later, didn't put more fuel in it. That's how he caught me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I put that on. He's going, where'd all the fucking fuel go? <laughs> Like someone so, siphoning gas. Who? Yeah. Well, those those Shuba boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the siphoning gas out of my tank. A little tank about this big. <laughs> yes, and then Ed. Then he had some bikes too. So Ed's my, that's all fast Eddie. He's my father. Yeah. He's the oldest of all us siblings. And was, he, was he a good oldest brother or was he a violent Tyrannical brother. He was a, he's had a hard, you know, a hot head. <laughs> really? Oh yeah, he had a temper just like the rest of us. You know, if he did something wrong, him and Fred used to feud a lot. Yeah. A lot of good stories about that one. Yeah, they told that sort of thing. They had really good ones. They, yeah, they battled hard. Yeah, but anyhow, I, I got Ed's bike running. I'm cruising all around the farm and stuff like that. And Ed pulls up in his '67 Beaumont and sees me on his bike, and he chases me. <laughs> past the barn into the field I take that thing I dump the bike I jump into the bush I don't think I came out till four hours later <laughs> I was cruising around the bush for four hours until he left the yard or something <laughs> yeah. and that one's kind of funny because at the end of the day I ended up buying that bike probably a year or two later anyhow <laughs> yeah yeah it was just a little street bike a little twin 100 or something but a cool little bike like right now it'd be a masterpiece yeah. Really? Yeah, it's a neat little bike. Cool. Yeah, so that's kind of the farming life. So, so you're farming. When did you start getting into races? Because I know um, you, you got into a variety of racing, right? Yeah. How yeah. old were you when you got into it? And when, what, what did you start with? I started with, um, I had a couple of junkers when I was about 15, 16, YZ 125s, and but just to dig around the farm. Yeah. Bikes. Yeah, these okay. are all dirt bikes. And that, so that was just cruising around the farm and always on a bike. Like me and Dale Mitchell, we did pedal bikes all the way until our teens, till we got older. And that's all we did was pedal our ass everywhere. I love Build that. bikes, you know, choppers, jump bikes, all that. And then the dirt bikes happened in the late teens, let's say. 
And then, uh, yeah, we started getting nicer bikes, faster bikes. I think my first major bike was a YZ250 1983. And that, so that's kind of where, hey, then I met a buddy, his name's Red Dog. Red that, Dog. Red yeah. Dog, I yeah. Red Crazy dog. guy and anything. Crazy than you. Yeah, yeah, in some ways. Because, man, I heard ways. you were like the, yes. one of the craziest weirds of us. So I got, we lived together. I think I moved out with him when we were 19. And, you know, we had 80 acres on an acreage we rented. And so we grabbed bikes. We needed bikes, right? So I got, uh, got him talked into getting a bike. And then another guy got a bike and he said, well, let's try ice racing this winter. Like, what are we going to do at winter? We got to do some racing. So, ice racing. Yeah. So, so we're you gonna explain ice what ice racing is so people can understand the insanity yeah. of what it is. Yeah. Well, most guys took a dirt bike and that and then studded their wheels. That's how it all starts. You take your knobbies and you put about three studs per knob. So at the end of the day, you got probably 300 screws sitting in your tires, front and back. And you hit the ice, and I mean, it's like, it's better than dirt almost. That's how much traction you have. Wow. So, you know, you're hitting the corners at 80 miles an hour and just kicking it in there, and it just hangs that corner and away It just go. sounds insane. Cause, yeah. So you're on a lake? Yeah. Yep. So guys... they clear off the lake, and with the dirt bikes, it was always an oval track. Yeah, so we ran ovals. Were you running jumps with these sons of bitches? No, no, there's usually about... 20 guys lined up in a row. That's how wide the track was and beeline it to that first corner. And hopefully you come out first. So you got a clear track ahead of you. Oh my God. So, and then yeah. what, what's a crash like with studded tires? This sounds like it'd it, be horrific. Yeah, it's nuts. It is nuts. Especially if you got 20 bikes going into that first corner. Cause if you and get like, run over, like you're yeah. just going to get, it's going to be like a, a Gatling gun. You're going to be punctured to all hell. It happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's it. Over? I didn't get run over. I seen a guy lose his leg because of it. And that, and it was a, uh, we don't want to get into that kind of story and that sort of thing, but it's just, there's so much moisture in the air. The carburetor stuck wide open down the straightaways. It just froze the carburetor and you get in that corner. Holy shit. And I remember this guy hit the bank and the bike went way flying in the air and the tires just eat and landed on his leg. Oh! And, uh, and I, my bike froze up that same day. I bailed off at the end of the straightaway. My bike hit the bank and it flipped over a van and a car. That's how high it went. It cleared the van and car right over top to the other side and still running when it was, cause it was wide open and the carburetor finally let go and went into an idle. But good thing that didn't kill somebody that's watching at the end of the straightaway. <laughs> Wild man, that, I, that was wild, and that was a CR 500, so that was a mean machine because that I mean, thing was fast. Like, there is no control measure, so you this that is like the ultimate freedom to me. It's just like there is yeah. so, the, the consequences, your mind must be like razor sharp when you're doing this because there is severe consequences. Yeah, I'd like to say it was supposed to be razor sharp, but you know, when we went to Fort McMurray and stuff like that, I mean, partied all night probably. Jumped on the bike in the morning and usually still won the race, but I'm telling you, it wasn't always the super sharp mind that you should have had. Because <laughs> okay. you're young, right? You're in the early 20s and that, and it was all about partying back then. So that was your first year you were doing studded tire ice racing on lakes in Alberta. Yeah, so, yeah. And then, because I know you transitioned into uh, speed bikes and you were very competitive, right? Yeah, yeah. So we won the Trump championship, I think, in '87 with the bikes ice racing, and okay. then yeah, then we did some national events with ice racing in '88. Cam Lou. What, what does that like national that. event look like for that? Well, that's where you get the best guys from Canada, right? Yeah, coming all to one spot. So and how no, is that? Is it like no, is it wild? Yeah, nobody's a slouch. Right there, you need to be razor sharp. Gotcha. You know, everybody is so fast. It's like. Going into a 360 race at Knoxville, you don't screw around. Everything better be spot on for you to win. Right. And uh, so we're doing really good, feeling good, you know, that sort of thing. We thought, uh, I said, what, I moved to Vancouver. Things were going good here and that. The job, I think I just, uh, I don't know if I ended up just quitting the job. I had to get out of Edmonton. So I loaded up my camper, my truck. Took my Kawasaki 1100 with me on a trailer and 
Beelinder to Vancouver. And is a Kawasaki and then, 1100 a pretty elite bike? That is just, it's just a street bike that you cruise with. Okay. That's what I had back then. So I knew a lot of guys in Vancouver and Kelowna and stuff like that from How the earlier you know days. These guys? Uh, just going to Kelowna every year for 30 days and just hooking up with all the locals and ended up hooking up with the crazy locals again, like uh, that had bikes. Like the guy that got me into this, his name is Robbie Much. They call him Robbie Too Much in all the papers and that. And this guy, you think I'm crazy? He's times two, easy. And that, so I meet him in uh, Kelowna. And this guy here is the guy that will drive through a gang of Harley Davidsons with his street bike and he stops in between the two and I I think what he did he ended up You mean Hell's Angels, right? <laughs> kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> and he spits on, he spits on the guy and that and then he wheelies down this down the center line in between all the cars, wheel up in the air, I bet you for a good mile. That's how good this guy was on a bike. He was born on a bike when he was three. So we all end up in Vancouver and he has a body shop. So I start working for him at the body shop and he's got this Gamma 500, which is a four cylinder, two stroke bike, pretty cool bike and stuff. And he says, he says, I'm going to go to a different bike. I got, uh, I think he had a Suzuki 750 and stuff. He says, why don't you buy my old one? I go, you crazy? I ain't doing that. I watch you guys fucking race. You're going 140 miles into a corner, back end up in the air, just laying on the front brake. And so, needless to say, I ended up buying the bike, <laughs> and I'm doing it next year. Yeah, so I do it the following year, and that, and came out of ice racing, then went into road racing. I had to do a couple of practice laps to make sure you're safe, and that. So I ended up following one of the experts, and that sort of thing, and I kept putting my leg down, like an ice racing bike, eh? So I kept playing. So about five laps, I kept putting my leg down. What am I doing? You've got to keep it on the pegs, right? Right. And that. So three or four laps later, uh, yeah, we're going pretty good already. So it wasn't long. And, uh, you know, we're, we're running probably the bottom step of the podium steady. I was either second or third on all these races in production 600 and 750. Really? And that. So we're, yeah, we're fast. So... I thought, you know, my bike kept breaking down the transmission and that it had a really weak transmission in that bike and it was crazy. It was gnarly to drive. You're popping wheelies coming out of hairpins and stuff like that, which you lose time. Right. Yep. So I bought a brand new bike and that's kind of how it all started in, I think, 1990 is when I bought my new bike. So I went to Expert right away. So what's, what's, what are the leagues in... Uh, in you just got Amateur and Expert. So expert and that, the big leagues, right? Yeah, and usually they won't put you an expert unless you're doing really well in amateur. Right. I should have stayed an amateur another year because I think I could have cleaned up in the West Coast anyhow. Right. And that probably could have got more sponsors, but nope, not me. I thought I better just go right to expert and go with the big boys right away. I like it. And that's what we did. And right away, uh, we we're in, you know, we were getting thirds and stuff like that with the big boys, which was good. You know, not dicing with the top guy yet. So we're getting fast. So was the top guy far superior than? No, he wasn't that far. Not on the 600 production. You know, these guys had three bikes. They had 600 production, 750 production, and super bikes. Right. And that, you know, and those are the big names. Like your Steve Crevier. He right. was the big name in the West Coast. Right. Right. And then when we went to the Nationals, we were against Pascal Picot, uh, Ruben McMurder, uh, Mercier, like all these guys, all the big boys. So it's pretty cool. Cruising around, the, well, we cruised right across Canada, right to Shubenacadie, Nova Scotia, Atlanta Motorsports Park. I think I finished 10th there in the 600 production. And then after that is when I went to Shannonville. And at Shannonville is uh, when I ate shit. I was, we were in qualifying. Came, came around that, it was like an 80 mile an hour sweeper onto the front straightaway with a concrete uh, barrier down the whole straightaway. They didn't have the bills up. My back end took off on me. I shot over. So the, you weren't even going hard. No. Well, I was going hard because it was qualifying, and that see what see what it was all about. New track, you know, trying to get your marks, your braking marks, and you know your apex, right, and that sort of stuff. And yeah, just uh, could have hit something on the track. I don't know, but anyhow, that's when I went over the bars, smashed into the concrete barrier. Then the bike smashed into me, and so your body hit the like. I didn't have my the same... body hit the pavement first, 
and then I smashed into the concrete barrier with my body. Going 80 miles. Yeah, and then my bike finished me off because <laughs> it slid into me too, right? That sort of thing. And I, I just remember kind of coming through and I go, holy f shit, where's my arm? I couldn't, I couldn't see my arm. I couldn't feel my arm or nothing. And that, and so all the medics come by and I say, where the hell's my arm? And that's what they show me my arm. Here's your arm. <laughs> it's still attached, but couldn't feel nothing. So you got ripped out. Yeah, the nerves out of the spine are, is what ripped out. I ripped out three nerves out of my spine. And, you know, so what they did to me within the next year is they took a bunch of nerve grafts out of my leg, went for my third, fourth rib, rib cage, attached to a bicep nerve. So when I tighten up my guts, this is what I got. And that's so... That's all off my guts. This this is such a yeah. This is like this is traumatic. Like this is one of those. It was ones to me. Like it's a, yeah. it's a it's a near life death yeah. experience. So when you go through like a crash like this, what, the, what is the after effect of something some, something so horrific? Because e, e got well, poor me, poor me for the first half a year or so, right? So you went into like you depression. Know, I was gonna I was gonna make a living at racing, right? That's what I thought. <laughs> Do you think so, you would have? Uh, you know, you could call it depression for a few months. Yeah. That sort of thing. But, you know, I think it happened at the right age. 26 years old, you're cockier and shit. Right. Right. You're not ready to lay over. Right. So you just end up continuing on the best you can. That sort of thing. And, yeah. So I think the next year I sold the race bike that I crashed. Bought a race car. Outlaw Modifieds is how we all started. And, you know, that was in 92 when Capital Raceway just opened and that. And so I started, then I think your dad started one year after me or the same year, Yeah, kind of got into it. And that's how it all began, 92, and we've been racing ever since. But like uh, with with like that kind of crash, because I'm kind of interested in this. Yeah. When people, I know a lot of people that get into big crashes and then they have the fear. Yeah. Like how did you, like you said it took, you were depressed for a few months and you just got back on your horse. Like that, most people don't do that. Most people use this as a crutch their whole life. So not only did you, in a few months, get your shit back together, you also don't have the fear. So what, what or do you have the fear? Well, you can't call that part fear. Like you need fear anytime you're racing, else you're not gonna do very good. Yeah, but- the, Like you can't be fear- But that's good fear. I'm talking that's the fear, good fear, yeah. I'm talking about the fear that cripples a man and a woman because they're so scared and they turn timid and they, and they're scared of life, not the fear yeah. that you go out and you're like, I'm scared of doing this task, but I know I'm gonna do it, and that's called courage. That's yeah. a big difference, that's not fear, that's called courage. Yeah, well, with me, yeah, do you know what? I had to start all over. You know, I was uh, building high rises in Vancouver, doing rebar, you know, just ripped all the time. Now, I gotta start over. So my tickets, my automotive journeyman ticket didn't mean nothing, my rebar ticket didn't mean nothing. So I had to establish myself again. So I got my parts ticket and that, you know, because I knew like, okay, I got to get a job. You know, I got to work, you know, maybe a year or two later, I almost look at it as godsend. You know, yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 I could, I could have kept racing. Maybe I, I know a lot of my buddies died on them bikes and stuff like that. And I think it's kind of settled me down because I was way up here at that time, like almost, Almost too cocky and that. So I think it brought me down, you know, and that's kind of when I met, uh, got together with my wife, you know, so stuff like that. No, not, yeah, right around just after I crashed, we got together, you know, because I was toned down. I was probably an asshole before. <laughs> and that, so no, met my wife and I think that's when my life changed. Really? And, that, and I think for the better. You think, you, know, you said think. Yeah, well, for, with the wife, yeah, for sure. But just life overall. And that I think that's when it changed and got better, grew up, you know, let's, let's, uh, you know, we kept racing. Like when I was with her, we kept racing. So we did four years of Outlaw Modifieds, won the championship, I think in 95, went to sprint cars Cause, yeah, in I think, 96. Because I remember when you, when I was a kid, I remember you driving the uh, Modifieds. Yeah. Because you, it, that's like the, the pointy nose ones, right? Yeah. Yeah. I remember you. Yeah. Uh, weird looking stuff, yeah. but open wheel. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and I had to see if I could do it because now I'm with one arm and that's so I, got, I run a spinner or a suicide knob, whatever you yeah. guys want to call it. And that's, and we put a quick, uh, quickener 
in the steering box and what have you. So it wasn't too bad driving that one. But you know, after four years, you go, hey, let's, let's try something else. Let's try right. something a little faster. And uh, you know, because we're doing okay with that, I could handle it. So let's try an extreme sprint car. And that. <laughs> Just, can you uh, explain to people? So my uncle, uh, Uncle Johnny here, or Johnny Weirsma, he drives a sprint car. He drives with a one arm and, and, and a ball bearing. So basically, you know, what he, we, we do with two, he does with one. And not only does he do that, you, you win. Yeah. You keep winning every division. And that's kind of another interesting thing is clear every every race uh, group you enter, whether it was speed bikes, ice bikes, modifieds, or sportsmen, extreme sprints, you, you became top dog or always top near top dog. Like where the where the hell did that come from? Like what like the cause I know I'm like hyper competitive. Yeah. Your, your hyper competitiveness is There's beyond no yeah, is it the weirdest ones? Like I don't know. Like what, what, what drove you to be such a a, a lunatic for for the the first place? Because I mean, there's people that get third, there's people that get second, there's, and there's people that just keep pushing it into like how do you keep pushing it to you becoming the best always? But nobody wants to be the first loser. Everybody, nobody, I mean, everybody wants everybody to win. Nobody wants to lose. But yeah. but why were you winning? What was the mentality of a winner? Because there's a big difference between third and first. It's a huge difference. Yeah. See, yeah, because when I started, we were called Team Cheap Racing. I mean, we had no money. Right. We went out there, and I don't know what it was. And that I just, I just kept the pedal to the metal, and you know, probably a little crazy and putting your car where it shouldn't be sometimes. That sort of thing. Like I see that now with the younger kids, and that I'm going, man, I used to do that. I go, that looked pretty dangerous, though. I, I can't believe, <laughs> I can't, I can't believe you pulled that off. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that I'm older and stuff, like I'm a lot more uh, methodical, I guess you could call it. Like I know where not to put my front of my car in. You know, these young kids don't care. You know, I like you watch out. I know a couple times last year I could have put like where I had a run coming down the back chute. These kids take the whole track. They don't get leave that lane, you know, anymore. Like even if they know somebody's coming, they'll just block you off. But you know, you stick your front end in there and they run over your left front tire, they're going for a good ride. And maybe some have to learn that. I don't know. And that because I it's tell gonna you, be, It's going to be me probably. <laughs> it's probably going to be me. Because I, I don't even know which what you're is, talking which about. Which is fine. But yeah, which is fine. And you got to find that group. And when your car's working well, you're working well, guess what? It probably felt right. Hey, yeah, that was easy. I, like I used to do it all the time. Right. And that, you know, my timing was right back then and uh yeah i won a lot of races i think i think i'm number one in wins for extreme sprints how many wins i don't have a clue come on you got and it. i have the number give me, one give me give me an estimate here 50 40 mm, yeah maybe right around there and then a whole bunch of heat wins and that sort of thing and then like now you know i'm still racing i turned 60 this year you're 60 i turned 60 this year and stuff and Last year is the first, well, I don't know if it's the first year, but first year I haven't won a feature race. Like I won lots of heat races and stuff, and I've been on the second and third step of the podium, but I never hit the first step last year. Does that piss you off? That's got to piss well, you yeah, because I'm trying harder this year getting it. Because so I talked to Wade, and he says that was the hardest part about leaving sprint car racing was not winning anymore. He said that was a huge hit yeah. to his ego. Because, I mean, like, man, I'm a competitor too. If I'm not scoring goals or if I'm not, yeah. you know, becoming – Going, joining like let's say climbing or surfing, and I'm not one of the top dogs. It's just like, oh, you guys, I'm, you guys haven't seen Psycho. I am coming for you. Like, yeah, I'm yeah. gonna yeah. be the best. You yeah, know? and I remember like I think I, about three years ago, four years ago, and stuff like that. I was working out quite a bit, feeling good. You know, I want to get a good year. We had a pretty good year, and, that, and then I slacked off last year. Didn't Why? get a win, but I still got third overall. To me, that's still not bad. If I'm in the top five. I'm not ready to quit, and that's so. That's not I'm, bad. I'm that's not the, that's not the attitude of a winner. Not bad at all. Yeah, just the way things were last year. Gotcha. We we had a new chassis. Couldn't get a handle on the chassis. That sort of thing. You know, it wasn't just wasn't something right. Like I'll go fast if my car feels like it can go fast. That sort of thing. But I'm not going to put my car in a situation where it doesn't feel right, and I'm going to overdrive it and put it up on the top net again. I don't right. want to do that. And that costs too much money now. So this year, I think we're ready. Um, I think we'll do better this year, I'm hoping. And I think we will. 
and that I've been training harder this year, you know, a lot more running, weights, all that kind of stuff. Because, you know, that car there, it is, it's a handful on a rough track. Dry slick, I could probably do 50 laps. We've got a 50 lapper coming up this year. And that, so I hope it's dry slick because if it's rough, 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 I'm going to have a hard time. And, that, and that's kind of why I quit the 360 class because that monster <laughs> is a handful. It's a and when it was always rough tracks, it seems like when I did the 360 car, because we did that for, I think, four years. Your dad gave me a ride, gave me an opportunity to run into a 360 car. So we did that. And I tell you, the rough tracks, I, at the end of the races, my pace would be, it was lacking. You know, the first 10 laps go like a bat out of hill. After that, you could just see us so fading off, fading down. off, worn down, making mistakes, that sort of thing. So, you know, I won one race in the 360 class, one feature race. And I think Sean and Wade, yeah. Sean Moran, Wade Flanagan, I think they got tangled up and crashed. And I had, it ended up being me and Billy Boyce. Uh, rest in peace, Billy. He passed away last year. And that's so me and Billy were tangling and I ended up winning that race. And that was the, that was the best ever winning that race. Cause I wheeled in, in an open trailer. I don't go. Yeah. 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 You know, I got the tires Just up. Rough neck and hard, you know? Yeah. Like I could, you know, back up around all those big haulers. <laughs> My trailer was so short. So it was pretty cool that I, you know, you can whip into a, uh, you know, a race like that in an open trailer, no parts, no money, and actually pull a win off. So that was pretty cool. That's kind of a highlight of the 360. It's badass. Everything else was bad. <laughs> no. Cool. cool. No, no, your dad, uh, that was nice of your dad to do that. You know. Yeah, uh, Fast Daddy does that, man. He's actually, he's really, yeah. really amazing for the community. He's Kelly Miller, Brody. Yeah. Know, yeah, well, he loves racing. Yeah. Man, he you loves know, racing. You betcha. And he's still out there doing it. So I don't know if he's going to. If he's going to do it full time this year or not, but it'd be nice if you are doing it full time. I'm doing it full time, and Ed's out there, and then your brother Mark, and then we can, you can know, somehow get Zach. If there's four Weirsmans out there, it should be entertaining. Yeah, because <laughs> we all hate to lose. Oh my god, <laughs> there's going to be carnage. Oh my god, we'll have to take out the Flemings first, you know, yeah. and Brody, and then we'll work as a little cartel. Let's take them out, and then yeah. we'll duke with ourselves. Yeah, and you know, and. You know, I got to thank Linda and my family for letting me do this this long. You know, she says, if it's not paying the bills, it's a hobby. <laughs> and, I, and I kept making excuses. And yeah, yeah, no, I'm good. no, we want this money. We want some money and stuff like that. But she was right. We never made no money. <laughs> yeah, right. Not enough to pay bills anyhow. Fair, fair. And that, so that was a fair saying. It just, I didn't want to believe it for a long time. Okay, yeah. my next question. What's your view on discipline? Because... Clearly, you must have had some discipline because you, your whole career of racing, you've been a winner. So, what was your approach to it? Like, how did? Because you sound like you're a wild, a wild boy. But I mean, like people think I'm wild, but I have like an extreme. I'm extremely yeah. disciplined when people don't see me. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, what was your viewpoint on it? I think it was start mom and dad. Dad, I never ever heard him swear, you know, and stuff like that. Everything was discipline. It was by the Bible. Very, very religious and stuff like that. So it started that way, you know, being at church, that kind of stuff. Um, I was quite rebellious, rebellious back then. And then uh, after that, it was uh, kickboxing. I kickboxed for three years. And I tell you, if you weren't disciplined doing that, you know, that instructor would kick your ass or get you the hell out of there. And then I had a couple of two different instructors and, uh, yeah, they... They kind of steer you in the right direction, you know. You you're you're never superior over anybody else. You're a person just like anybody else, and act like a person. Be nice to people, you know. Respect. Sort of Respect. Simple thing, man. Yeah. If you Respect. if you have that quality, it's, yeah. And then if someone disrespects you, then it can be you can deal with it. But. At the beginning, you it's respect. Yeah, and a lot of fighters are like that. You know, they were taught, like, they know they can beat up any one of you five guys right yeah. there. But it's respect, and, you know, they'll talk their way out of it before they'll actually right. kick somebody's ass. And do you think those, Grandpa, my Grandpa Wiersma and uh, the kickboxing is what kind of drove this, this discipline? Or did you continue that discipline as you went on? Because I think yeah. you, you did work hard, play hard, right? Yeah, work hard, play hard. Um, you know... Again, losing the right use of my right arm uh, really changed me. Right. For the better. Right. I think. 
and that, you know, and that's, uh, that's kind of when everything kind of turned around for me in a better way, that sort of thing. And yeah, and here we are, what, 40 years later, <laughs> oh, 34 years later, actually my number. This is your year. This is the year. June, June 30th, year. 1990 is when I crashed. Yeah. So number 34, this is my year. This is it. And I don't know if this is the last year. We're not sure yet. Everyone we'll see. Keep saying that, but it yeah. just seems like. As long as I can see proper and my vision is good. Right. I could probably keep going. You need a better helmet. Yeah. There you it's go. Is that what it is? Uh, well, I had a really shitty helmet and it was tough. <laughs> but, uh. Yeah. How about, um, is there anything in racing that, uh, taught you that you use in real life? Discipline's a big one. Like. It's I, not even that. You got to make your, sure your car is tight. So there's a lot of prep. Oh, lots of prep. You know, it's, it's full-time job away from a full-time job. Right. And that, you know, a lot of people go out there half, half ready, that sort of thing. Their shit, you know, falling off their cars, causing accidents, whatever, because of it, that sort of thing. Um, I'm way past that now. You know, if my car is not ready to go on the track, it ain't going on the track. Okay. And Dale, my crew manager, and he'll make sure it's not on the track because he always makes sure everything's safe. You know, seat belts better be right up to snuff. Everything better be up to snuff. So he and that he takes right? care of me. Okay. Yeah, he buckles me in every race for forty years, pretty well. Dale's been with me. He's like, been with you for forty years. Well, we've been together since we were five. Did everything together, and that. And now he's he's been my crew chief forever and stuff. He buckles me in. He makes sure everything's tight. He makes sure I'm safe. You know, everything. Because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't race. You know, so really, because that brings me to my next question. Like, how, how do you, like, how do you have a team? Like you built a yeah. team about you, right? So you got Dale, but yeah. how do you inspire the team to keep coming to help you do the work at the shop? Winning. Okay. Winning is what? Winning drives. helps. Okay. Winning helps. You know, nobody's going to want to. Like cases of beer help too. Like, okay. Hey, come on over. I got, I just bought two honey, 48 beers. Yeah. I can't drink them all alone. Yeah. Half the crew. Yes. <laughs> the other half, you know, now that we're older and that, you know, you don't uh, drink as much as the guy used to. Can't get away with that anymore. Anyhow, that sort of thing. So yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's all comes discipline and uh, now we're more prepared. You know, and I'm hoping, you know, like what I lack in uh, craziness now, hopefully the experience takes that part of it over and still can win some races. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I'm not, you know, I used to wreck my car quite often. <laughs> and then I don't remember wreck... you wrecking too much, you know? Well, I don't know what you call often. You know, I'd, I'd go, I, yeah, I'd, say I, I'd say I'd, I'd wreck at least once a year. Yeah, that's what I would thought, but that's yeah. pretty good because there's some guys that are way worse. Yeah, and then on some bad years, you know, probably three, four times, but, and that depends what you call wreck. I call a wreck a rollover. That's, that's wreck. And yeah, that, yeah, you know, from, you know, if you just tag a guy with a wheel or something and bend a tie rod, who cares? Yeah. That sort of thing. But yeah, no, we got good stuff this year and that's so I'm really looking forward to this year. Are, are you and now we got some new owners now way right here and uh, hopefully some things change. Cause that, that. that's another thing. Are you like, what are you, uh, with the track, what it was before, let's say even before my dad, what do you think could have made uh, Rad Tor, Castro, Capital a better racetrack? Like, what do you think they need? Because it's always nice to hear uh, feedback from people. Like, what would make that uh, track just an exceptional experience for not only the drivers but also the fans? Well, first you got to keep the facility in a good shape. You know, Everyone things have to be painted. Yeah. yeah, everything yeah. has to be painted, looking good. Um, a lot of sponsorship along the walls. You know, wherever you can put sponsorship flags or whatever, a lot of that. But to get sponsorships, obviously you need uh, good racers for one. You need a lot of them. And How many do you think we need? Like 30 sprint cars? Yeah. yeah. So we're around right. 20 right now. Yeah. No, we're, we're lacking still. It's just, it's, it costs a lot of money, that sort of thing. And everybody wants to see a paid, you know, everybody wants to get paid. Right now. And that's fair. That's a fair that, thing. That's fair. Because it's yeah. an expensive, it's expensive sport. Right. And you're putting your heart, you're not only, you're putting your time into it, you're, you should get something yeah. if you're exceptional. And you got four or five guys working on that car with you, you know. Right. And they, you know, if you're, if you're crashing every weekend, they don't want to be with you. You know, if you're winning, uh, they're, they're not into the money at all. And neither am I. I'm not into the money anymore. You know, back in the day, it, yeah, it'd be nice to get a paycheck or something like that. 
but now it doesn't matter. You know, I got a business now that I started and uh, I just, you know, write it off. That's my sponsorship, my advertising for my business. And that's what I do it for now. You know, my dream is to, I'd love to go to Knoxville and run a 360 race or something like that. You know, everybody would. But you better. You think you can do? You're you, gonna do it before uh, you're done. I just have a hundred and sixty thousand dollar car. <laughs> you know, we're talking at least one hundred and sixty. I bet you for a top notch car, all titanium up. You know, talk to Kelly Miller. I bet you. You know, you need a seventy thousand dollar engine. And that. Jesus. So, you know, if you're gonna go there, you and you got special engines for that track, right? You need, everything has to be top notch, else you're just gonna go there, finish a G main in last place. Who wants to do that? Okay. Yeah. And then if, even if you wanted to get into the more, you probably have to race that circuit for at least a year because I was talking to Wade there, Wade Fleming. Yeah. And he was saying like he was with the top dogs, he got his bucket list, he started by uh, Steve Kinzer. Yeah, yeah, and, I got uh, that picture on my wall at work. Yeah, yeah. badass, right? Yeah, yeah. So he did that and he said the first corner because he didn't know how to hucking in the corner like the pros, someone hitting them in the back. And he said he went as hard as he could. He just didn't go in the right area. Cause there's a certain, like, there's like- Was they, he not running a 360 engine with the 410s though? I don't know. He said, basically he went as hard as he could in that corner. And he said that the pros would go further. So he would start turning here and the pros would start turning up here. So yeah. they would cut way harder. And he said, he just didn't know yeah. That you can get speed like that. And that's where the pros, you know, that's the difference. You know, he says, I went as hard as I could and they still spun me out because I just, I didn't do it right. Yeah, yeah. So that's like that being yeah. with the elite. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And we're talking horsepower. We're talking everything. Yeah. They, these guys, you know, they're in their cars three days a week. That sort of thing. And cool. that's, you just get comfortable. They know their car is going to turn at 130 miles an hour going into a corner. Yeah. And, and hang in there. And hang in there. Yeah. Yeah, 110 yeah. miles an hour is insane. Yeah. On and, a dirt track. And that's all your confidence. That's confidence. That's the confidence you need. You know, that's like me. If I, like when I'm doing warm ups and stuff, I flat footed into that thing. And then I know if my car is going to do the right things. You know, I try to make sure that my car can go full out through all the corners. And that, and if I got to back off, okay. Maybe, maybe it's the track. Maybe it's my setup a little bit, but. Right. You know, that's what I always gauge for without lifting. Gotcha. Yeah. And if I have to lift, obviously the setup's wrong or the track's not there for me. This yeah. year, do you have a, who's your, who's your competitor? Who are you worried about? Who, who's well, the guys that you want to make a, a, a narcissistical boost of, I kicked this guy's butt this year, or I won this uh, race against this competitor. I, I always like to, I, I like to go up against Kelly Miller. Okay. Is that, that's uh, who I'd love to beat. Because it, yeah, because he goes to Knoxville, he's active, he's racing down south. To me, he's one of the better racers around this area right now. That sort of thing, because he puts in the seat time. He's racing every weekend. What about Brody sort of Anderson? Thing. Well, Brody does our, you know, Brody's not with the 360s down south or anything like that. Brody's great here. You know, you can't be Brody on an extreme sprint car. Right? He proved that a couple of years straight. Now, he is Brody, keeps kicking butt, you know? Yeah. And, you know, and he's still, like, watching him last year, I think, was on the last race, the way he dove down in one and two and just did a slide job up. And, you know, he's got, he's got that passion, you know? Yeah. yeah. For a quiet guy, he is a ruthless competitor. Oh, yeah. He's, he's, he's fast, you know? So I love being Brody, if I can. <laughs> you know, years ago, I could. Not no more. No. And that, well, you know, I still have, but you know, not continuously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, plus, if you win too much, they hate you. That's good. <laughs> That's what you want. That's yeah, I'm sticking with this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, so that's good. But, you know, been racing all my life. It's treated me well. Um, you know, it's tough on the family sometimes. Well, Zach is now part of it, so I must be nice. Yeah. Too. But, you know, I quit, I think, 360s, I quit. I just got kind of tired of it. Yeah. You know, not running, you know, not running up front. And that, so I quit and uh, I thought I better become a family man. Like I, I, I spent all my time at the track. I, you know, I wasn't much of a family man then and I feel bad for it now. So I started uh, coaching soccer. I coached soccer for 15 years with my daughter and my son, Ruby and Zach. And that was... That, those are my best memories now. 
Really? And that, you betcha. Those are good. You know, fam family memory, memories are always good. Awesome. Racing memories, they come in second, but they're always good too, right? Yeah. 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 And that. So you got to put family first. Like if anybody's watching, do that first because they only, uh, they only grow up once. Right, right. A car can come around anytime. It's fair. Yeah, you betcha. My next question. Are you a man of faith? Do you, uh, do you believe in God or anything like that? Or, and if you do, have you ever had a moment where, you know, you, you'd say like you felt, you know, that divine intervention or anything like that? Yeah. No, I believe in God and I did it all my life. Um, it's a lot weaker now than in my earlier years. Probably like I don't go to church anymore or anything like that. But you know, the faith is still there. I still pray. That's her thing. The faith is still there. And I think in a way it kind of guides you. But you know, it's always, you know, when terrible things happen, you like to blame it on somebody. And that's not the person to blame it on by any means. But you know, sometimes you want to be thrown a bone. But sometimes you, know? you can have a terrible thing happens and it turned out to be something very good. Yeah. You know, well, I've had a lot of bad things happen. And you know what? I would say they were extremely positive in the end. Yeah, no, you know, true story. Yeah, you know, sometimes bad things have to ha happen for you to grow bigger, you know, that you see it later. Holy shit. And I always yeah. look at it, you can't have like the light without the dark, you know, like you can't, right. you don't know, you don't know what good is until you've been bad. And right. I don't mean talk about or saying that that's bad. I mean, you experience being a piece of shit and then yeah. you can say, I know what bad is. Yeah. I know what good is now. I have that's experienced like, both sides. That's like being at the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. You know, you think you got nothing left and you bounce back up and you know, hey man, there is something out there I can, yeah. you know, I can go after. And a lot of people don't hit the bottom of that barrel. Right. You know, and uh, once you do, you know what bad is and that sort of thing. And I think it, uh, you know, you grow up a lot. If yeah. you hit that bottom and you bounce back up and that, and you know, is it going to happen more than once in your lifetime? Yeah, probably. And I know every time when I like had a life, like a breaking point, not like, not with tears, just a breaking point where yeah. it's like, you're so uncomfortable and life sucks so bad. You're just like, this is fucking awful, man. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, this ain't going to last forever. Then you kind of have a refractory period where you just want to get away from it. But then you come back always stronger. You just get, you build these stressors up. You just become. But you still need that support group. You know, you got to have support. If it's your family or whatever, the support has to be there always. And that you need somebody to bounce back on, you know. And that's where mom and dad come and play, I think. That's where Jesus, Jesus comes and play, you know. You need a bit of a support group, your friends, you know, that right. kind of thing. Okay, I have another question. Um. You, you went, uh, kind of ties in what you just said here. You've done a lot of great things. You've won a lot of races. You've been an exceptional competitor. And I know as uh, you start moving up the, the ranks of humanity, the hierarchy, whatever you want to call it, as you continue to move up, it gets lonelier and lonelier, lonelier because you can connect less with people because they don't know your obsession. Like I know when I was younger, I had lots of friends because of, you know, I could relate to them, but as I continue to niche down to certain topics, I mm -hmm. connect less and less with human beings. Even though I, I, they're still my friends, there's only a few people that kind of understand some of the madness, yeah. and those are the only people. Do you ever find that you get lonely on that aspect of things? In, in certain areas, but you know, just I'm always talking to people. Like I don't, I don't mean that. I don't mean yeah. talking. I mean people that you can connect with on your level of madness. Cause I mean, I can talk to people too, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. where you're like your obsession to be a winner. Cause I mean, as you, as you ratchet it up, there's just less people that understand. And they're like, why, why would you, why are you going there? Why, 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 why try so hard this or that? Where most people just want to be in that comfortable baseline. Yeah, no, I don't, I haven't really experienced that because no. I think it's because I have probably the same friends for 40 years. Ugh. And that, you know, it's yeah, not like I true. didn't lose all my friends as I was getting older or anything right. like that. So I, no, I haven't felt that much. Okay. That way. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And, and maybe it is because I had so many friends. Like I, I'm still, I'm still hanging with probably a half a dozen friends that I had when I was like 10 years old. Wow. You know, cool. or high school, eh? And that's so, 
you know, not like it's not everyday stuff, but like Dale, I see him at least once a week. We're always working on the car. We got car nights, that sort of stuff. So, you know, so yeah, I haven't really experienced that yet. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Okay. All right. I got two more questions. Two more. And then we're done. Okay. You ready? ready for this you, you ready? Okay. So as you get older, you know, um, I think a lot of kids nowadays, a lot of people now don't have a direction or a purpose. Right. What, uh, when did you find your purpose? What was it? And how did you stumble into it? And what is the purpose? Because I'm kind of interested in this. I'm going to go back to wife and kids. So family? That's, the 26. That's what made me a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's where it gave me purpose. I was... Can you elaborate on that? I never bit? really knew what I wanted to do until, you know, until that time came. That sort of thing. Like racing, I just did it for the hell of it, you know. And we ended up being good at it, so let's go racing. You know, you do what you're good at. Gotcha. Right? You know, like you, soccer. Soccer, soccer, soccer. You were awesome soccer. at soccer and yeah. stuff. And that, and then I think uh, purpose is when you have kids. Gotcha. And that, wife and kids, and that, and you better have purpose at that time. Because they're the ones that are going to lose out at the end if you don't. And that's so you better figure it out in a hurry. Is that why you started the, the business as well? Just to kind of grade that? <sighs> that's kind of a story all on its own and stuff. You know, I, I was at McCoy Brothers, heavy truck repair for 10 years. And uh, they're going to close the parts store. So they put me at the back counter. So I'm selling springs at the back counter. I'm doing shipping. I'm doing this and that. And I'm doing every aspect of that job. And I thought, why don't I do it for myself? But the funny part is, so I went to your brother's shop and I worked there for about 16 months. Yeah. And I didn't like it. And that just the people that came in, you know, always wanted that extra saving a dollar. You know? Yeah. You, you want you, you sell a part for $2 yeah. and they'll give you a dollar. I, I didn't like that type of person. Yeah. That sort of thing. So... I rented the shop across the road. It was uh, me and their transmission guy. We rented two little shitty bays, really. I don't even know what we paid, 700 bucks each a month or stuff. And I started by rubbing two pennies together. And 18 years Enjoy later, 18 years later, we're doing good. I don't even know if I told my wife that I was doing that at first until things got <laughs> going. Because, yeah, I don't know. I, I took a risk. But back then, I didn't think of it as a risk. But it was... Like now that I think back, it was a lot harder. If I knew it was going to be that hard, I probably wouldn't have done that at that time. Why? And that, because, well, well again, you you're kind of fearless. You're still young. You got time to rebound back if it doesn't work. But, you know, we did baby steps. Like, I mean, tiny, tiny baby steps when we started that. Like, we started with nothing. And then, you know, I built a couple of trucks. I sold the trucks and I bought a U-bolt machine. It bends U-bolts to tie your spring to your differential. That's how it all began was with that machine and uh, yeah you know and then you don't see nothing for six years you're working on overdrafts to pay your guy for the first six years I know the and six years was the turnaround and then after that okay it get easier and easier and easier but i tell you those six years were feeling. six years were tough especially when you got a young family yeah I, I, i'm like yeah. i didn't have that I, I worked in the oil patch and yeah. it was seven years of taking every paycheck and i'm and always saving it and putting it towards real estate yeah. It wasn't seven years until I actually seen some gain out of it. Gain, yeah. And it's just, you don't even know what you're doing. Like, yeah. what am I fucking doing? And it's hard work. Yeah, it's like, what? Yeah. Like, I don't know what I'm and doing. You don't have a life. You so, know. that was a, yeah, like, it takes about six years. Again, I can ask you that question. That probably made you grow up tenfold. Well, as soon as I bought that, piece, that. Of, piece of land in Ecuador, if you saw me at 24 and 25 as a completely different human being. Yeah. As soon as I bought that piece of land, I had purpose. I knew exactly what I wanted. Yeah. And it just kept getting better and better. Yeah. 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 No, that's true. That's what you need. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. Last question. Ready? It's the last, last one. one. Oh, Here oh. it is. Okay. You, you're on your deathbed. You're, gonna, you're six. You're 80 years old. You have five minutes to live before you die. Eaten by worms and bugs and soil and earth. Put back into the universe. Yeah. What's your biggest regret? Like when you look back at your life, what do you regret the most? Uh, probably being away from the family, racing. Really? Yeah, yeah. You know, because the family didn't come to the track back then, really. So, you know, you 
Again, I wasn't really around as much as I should have been. So really, I'd have to put that on me. And that, that'd probably be the biggest regret. That's what yeah. I hear a lot from the, what Wade said too. He said the racing took a lot of. Yeah, it did. It takes a lot of time and stuff. Okay. And yeah, yeah, you know, and yeah, to make uh, two of those, like I know a lot of people take their family to the track and stuff like that. But when you're that young, the wife is doing all the work. You're up in the stands, kids are running around like crazy people and you're sitting in the pitch, you know, working on the car, getting ready to go. So right. that was hard work. Got to give her kudos. Yeah. No, Linda did a great job. Cool. Yeah. Well, Uncle Johnny, that's, uh, that's all I got. It yeah. was great. No, that was good. Thank and you. I'm, not, I'm still shaking. Are you? <laughs> no, no, I'm good. Awesome. Yeah. Cheers. All right.